When it comes to personal achievement, the importance of being able to effectively deal with other people cannot be overestimated. Now that you've discovered your mission and formulated your goals, the next step is to learn how to build rapport and develop strong relationships. NLP Comprehensive Trainer Gary Schmidt will guide you in becoming an expert at influencing and motivating others. He'll also guide you through a process that will give you the most important resource for lasting success, a positive relationship with yourself. The best communication professionals create lasting relationships. Most professionals intuitively know the importance that other people play in their lives. In fact, it would be no exaggeration to say that people are the most important resource that we ever have. Since relationships are so important, and since the most successful professionals in any field build strong relationships, wouldn't it be useful to know how they accomplish this? Hello, I'm Gary Schmidt, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you the latest findings and techniques for enhancing your rapport, relationships, and persuasiveness using the new technology of achievement, neuro-linguistic programming. Many self-development training programs attempt to address this issue by describing successful individuals. Some of the better ones go so far as to tell you what to do. Anyone who has tried to learn a new physical activity, a sport for example, knows the problem with this. If you tried to hit a golf ball, you were told to avoid pushing with the following hand. That's what to do. Everyone who's ever played golf can probably tell you that. Very few can tell you how to actually do that seemingly simple instruction. If you want to fully integrate any set of skills into your life, you need to know both what to do and how to do it. You're about to learn some of the specifics, the how-to, of how to make you the most successful person you can be. Research has demonstrated that 83% of all sales are based upon the customer liking the salesperson. Studies show that people are more apt to stay in jobs where they feel liked and appreciated than in work where they might be paid more. Famous achievers like Lee Iacocca and Mary Kay know the importance of relationships. Iacocca is often described as open and immediate. He makes personal contact, is liked and trusted. People feel good being around him. Mary Kay's tremendous success is directly attributable to her primary business concern being people. Ask her about management and you'll hear about people. She said, treat others the way you want to be treated, on and off the job. Listen closely to others' concerns and show that you value them. Successful people have the ability to develop relationships that last over time. NLP research has shown that many high achievers have the ability to develop liking and appreciation very rapidly. They naturally make people feel comfortable around them and demonstrate a concern for others' values. And inversely, those who are marginally successful or unsuccessful altogether typically lack these abilities. Many approaches to sales and management communication training recognize the importance of rapport. They often suggest that the way to rapport is matching content or the life experience of the other person. So, if the other person likes baseball, you try to like baseball too. This approach will work some of the time. Yet people build relationships where there isn't any mutual interest, such as baseball or any other sport. I'm using the word relationship instead of rapport for a reason. Rapport is an important aspect of every relationship. Right now, it's popular to teach techniques for rapport. In fact, instant rapport is the promise of some. And because establishing and maintaining rapport is so valuable, I will describe several ways for you to do that successfully. To build rapport in a moment, it is possible. However, not many people have relationships that last only for an instant. Unless you plan on managing or selling to new and different people all the time, unless your business doesn't want and value referrals, then you need to consider what is happening in your business relationships through time. As a business professional, it's useful to ask the question, what business am I in? Some people think that if they sell things, they're in the business of selling. They aren't. They are in the business of building relationships, because that's how you sell things. 
Similarly, those in management are in the business of building relationships because that's how you get things done. There are three parts to what the most successful professionals do to build relationships. They are, first, determining mutually satisfying goals. Second, establishing and maintaining nonverbal rapport. And third, producing positive feelings in others. So let's get going. The first step in building successful relationships of any kind is to consider the goal for the relationship. What kind of relationship do you want? Too often, people have no idea what they want in a relationship, which leaves it open to huge misunderstandings and missed opportunities. Think of when you went out for your first job interview. If you were anything like me, you were totally concerned about the job. You thought that the only goal of that meeting was to get the job, which of course it wasn't. The primary goal of that meeting was to get the interviewer to like you, or at the very least for him or her to identify how you would be an asset for that company. By achieving that goal, you would then have had a much better chance of getting the job. I know a tremendously successful commercial real estate developer who understands this principle well. Whenever she has a meeting with someone for the first time to determine if they might work together on a project, she has a very definite goal in mind. She goes into the meeting planning to build rapport, to help the person have a positive experience of her, and then agree to another meeting. In order to have relationships contribute to your success and to prevent frustration, it is important to become aware of the goals for the various relationships in your life. Sometimes you have already developed goals for your life to quite a high degree. When you think of those goals, do they include the people necessary to achieve them? It's great to have certain sales goals in your mind, for example. However, if when you think about these goals, you see only the products or services you will sell, you are leaving out something. This is often imagined in the mind's eye as seeing those goals right in front of you and the people you need to engage with you in getting those goals further away, like they don't matter so much. That's not useful. If you talk to someone who is a good manager, like Lee Iacocca or Mary Kay, and if these masters of relationship understood their own thinking consciously, they would tell you their secret. They would tell you that you should make the people closer and more vivid in your mind's eye because it's the relationships with people in your world that make the achievement of your goals possible. You might want to do that for yourself in a way that you find very compelling now. Joe Girard, the most successful automobile dealer in the world, knew what kind of relationship he wanted to build with each of his customers. He knew their birthdays, anniversaries, favorite sports, and other interests. He went so far as to send his customers cards and talk with them about what mattered to them. He lived the notion that relationships make the man or woman successful. To begin to build that kind of success, let's use these three steps for setting goals. First, think of a specific person where you already have a relationship. Or, pick someone to think about that you are just getting to know. What do you want in the relationship with that person? I emphasize that person because your goals may be unique for certain individuals, whereas for others there may be some more common goals. Next, we run this goal through the goal realization conditions Kelly Gerling taught you. Just making this an additional goal is not enough to make it happen. If you want specific success, you need to do specific techniques. Think about that relationship goal in the positive. Remember to make your goal a do-want rather than a don't-want. I want a source of referrals or a friend and colleague, not I want to avoid conflict. Also, is the goal something that you can do something about yourself? If what you want in a relationship is something that you can't control, then you can easily become very frustrated. For example, in a situation of conflict, since you can't control the other person, there's no point hoping that he or she will behave in a way that you like better. Instead, a goal for such relationship might be for you to stay resourceful and calm so that you can ask good questions, hoping to find out what the other person really wants. This is something you can control. A second major element to your goal is what evidence will let you know when you have reached this goal? What will you see and hear and feel that will let you know that you are achieving your goal? 
Once you know what goal you have for the relationship immediately, what might you want in six months or a year? I remind you of the findings of Tom Peters in his research on corporate excellence. He found that one of the things that characterized the most successful corporate executives was their thinking about goals over time. While some executives are proud of plans spanning a few fiscal quarters or even a year, the most successful think much more long term, some actually thinking in terms of decades. The salesperson who thinks only of how to sell the next widget will be less successful in the long run than the one who looks into his or her future, thinking not only about this one sale, but of the type of relationships that will naturally lead to many other sales, referrals, and additional business in the future. To reiterate, when you think about any relationship which could be important to you, answer these questions. First, what do I want in this relationship that is positive and which I can do? Second, what will I see or hear or feel that will let me know that I have achieved this goal? And third, what do I want for the relationship immediately? What do I want long term? What do I want even longer term? Whenever you think about relationships, create goals that meet these three conditions. Then, as the relationship develops, keep these goals in the forefront of your mind as a way to help you and the other person get what you both want. Rapport is the fundamental prerequisite for all effective communication. If you don't have rapport, you simply will not be effective with other people, period. Rapport is a natural human ability. We naturally build rapport in a variety of ways. When a couple has been together for a long time, they often are described as being a lot alike, sometimes becoming so much alike that they actually look alike. When you watch someone who is a mentor, he or she may wear the same brand of suit and use the same phrases and tone of voice. Business people dress so that they will look like they belong to the culture of their corporation. It is a powerful human need to try to fit in. We all have many examples of these behaviors because we do them already. They are based on some form of being similar, familiar, or alike. By finding ways to be alike, we reduce our differences and find the common ground upon which to base a relationship. You have been in rapport without thinking about it at many times throughout your life. And then there are times when you are out of rapport. It's important to be able to recognize when you have rapport and when you don't. How do you know the difference? To find out, try this experiment the next time you get a chance. Pick a situation with a friend or associate where you already have rapport and the situation is casual. By casual, I mean that there isn't something really important going on. You're just visiting, as opposed to asking for a raise, for example. After you've both started talking and the conversation is moving along smoothly, you're naturally in rapport now, try the following. Sit in a posture that is different from the person you're with. You may also try moving in different ways or speaking at a very different rate or volume. Notice how this changes the interaction. It will probably become choppy. Your friend might even ask, what's wrong? Notice what happens to your feelings. That uncomfortable feeling that you'll be getting is a signal that you are not in rapport. Of course, I can't be certain that you will call the feeling uncomfortable. That is the word a lot of people use to describe how they know when they're out of rapport. Just take the time to note what the feeling is that you experience when you don't have rapport. You can use that feeling as a signal to let you know when you need to do something to get rapport. We call that feeling a rapport detection alarm. The goal is to train yourself to recognize when the alarm goes off and then to do something to regain rapport. By the way, if you successfully broke rapport with your friend during that experiment, please take the time to rebuild it quickly with one of the techniques coming up. There are two different ways to think about rapport. The first way is to intentionally build rapport whenever you begin an interaction with someone and you want to be successful. The second approach is to assume you have rapport with someone and make sure that you have your rapport detection alarm turned up to a high level of sensitivity. We recommend that you use both approaches. 
especially as you are becoming more adept at these skills. Whichever approach you fully master first, be aware of the value of the rapport alarm. For example, in the sale of an expensive item, like a home, the relationship between the salesperson and the buyer often lasts for several days or weeks. Although the relationship may start with high levels of rapport, it is common for rapport to be lost before the closing. If this happens, it is crucial for the salesperson to be able to detect that rapport is lost and know how to rebuild it quickly. What happens if you can't? In sales, the customer often goes someplace else. While I used an example from sales because it's so obvious, the same concern is just as true in any business or personal relationship. As anyone who's been married for a while recognizes, the relationship started with, and of course hopefully still has, lots of rapport. Even with the best relationship, however, there are times when rapport is lost and must be rebuilt. Rapport skills are to get back that lost common ground for relationship, that foundation for you to do a good business or to have a good marriage or to be good friends. When you don't have rapport with someone, what can you do? The most effective communication professionals gain rapport by a technique called matching, also referred to as mirroring. Matching occurs naturally when two people already are in rapport. However, these techniques may be used consciously to establish and increase rapport. When you are doing things deliberately for rapport, it is to get back to states of mind that you would have naturally if people weren't distressed, in their heads, thinking about something else, or simply not paying attention. One of the things that people do when they are in rapport is to align themselves with the other person. Alignment can occur on several levels. As I mentioned earlier, when two people share common interests, they become closer. Remember talking about baseball in common. A more powerful way in which people align with others is with their physical use of space. When you are sitting with someone in your living room and want to show them a photo album or a book, you usually sit next to them, don't you? And doesn't this position naturally lead to more of a sense of togetherness and sharing? When some business people meet at a table with a colleague, they consistently sit opposite them. Others sit at the side of the table nearest the other person. You'll notice how our verbal expressions reflect these different choices. Would you rather square off with someone? <laughs> we all know what happened in the Old West when you did that. Or would you rather share space? By aligning your body so that you are literally pointed in the same or at least a similar direction, you are more likely to see things the same way, to get in tune with each other, and to feel in sync. When you sit or stand in alignment, it's as if you share the same space or screen in front of you both. You and the person you're talking with will naturally make hand gestures toward this common space. If you're in agreement and sharing common interests, it's easy to feel aligned. When you have conflict or are building common interests, your physical alignment can help accelerate the technique of gaining cooperation. Another way to build rapport with people who are upset is to align with their emotional state of mind. Some of my early psychology training taught me just the opposite. I was told that when someone was upset, and especially angry, that the idea was to remain calm. So when someone is yelling, I'm mad as hell at you and I don't know why you did that, the response is supposed to be, so what seems to be the problem? I was told to respond as if I just had a lobotomy. Does this calm the person? Not usually. In fact, it usually makes them really mad. When someone is emotionally stressed, it's a lot more effective to align with the emotion that is said or demonstrated. This doesn't mean you agree with what someone is saying. What works is to acknowledge the emotion, both verbally and non-verbally, to align with it. So to replay our previous example, I'm mad as hell at you. So you're really upset with me, and I'm wondering if you and I could sit down for a moment and we could talk calmly about what it is that upset you, since I'm sure the reason you want to talk to me is to resolve this issue and to maintain our relationship. Isn't that true? Now that's going to be hard to disagree with, isn't it? And it's likely to help the other person feel that you understand them. The way to align with someone who is upset is to notice their response and comment upon it. You seem really upset. What makes the effect more complete is aligning non-verbally as well as verbally. 
So if the other person's voice is somewhat loud and rapid, your voice is the same. As I demonstrated, you start out aligning with the other person's voice, then you can calm down your own voice. If you have aligned well enough with the other person, they will follow you when you change your voice. If not, try again. Aligning yourself with someone is a great metaphor to help you remember what to do literally when you want to build the common ground upon which relationships develop. In summary, you can align with common interests, body orientation, or emotional state. What can you do when the situation prevents you from literally aligning with the other person? For example, if you are in someone else's office and they have you sitting directly opposite them, you can still build rapport. One way to help both of you feel more comfortable is to match the other person's posture. As you sit with a person, notice how he or she is sitting and slowly begin to adjust your body to match his or her posture. Notice the angle of this person's spine. Is it very upright or slightly leaning to one side or to the front? How about the person's head? Is it tilted to one side or very straightforward? If you suddenly sit just like the other person, you will be mimicking him or her and you will break rapport. The goal is to slowly and unobtrusively approximate the posture. This is not some new technique, is it? You have undoubtedly noticed that when things are going along really well in some interaction with a friend, that you are likely to sit or stand like one another. Sometimes you are not able to either align or match postures with someone. Certainly, if you're on the phone, you can't do either of these techniques. Whether in person or on the phone, the most powerful way to establish rapport is to match the rhythm of the other person's voice or movements. To do this, simply match the rate at which the other person is speaking or moving. What you're doing when you do this is matching the cadence of the other person's thoughts. Have you ever been really excited about something and you were rolling along the tracks of your thoughts at about 90 miles an hour? and the other person hadn't even gotten on the train? Did you have much in common with the person at that time? I don't think so. I learned a great lesson about the impact of matching when I was in my early 20s, before I knew anything about NLP. I grew up in New York, and even amongst New Yorkers, I can get talking and thinking pretty fast, especially when I'm excited about something. When I moved to South Carolina, I was in for culture shock, if y'all know what I mean. I knew I needed rapport, but at first had a hard time getting it. I instinctively tried several ways to be more like the people around me. It would have been disrespectful for me to mimic the accents I heard. Instead, for me to slow down and speak and move at the same rate that they did meant I was matching the rhythm of their thinking. And I built great new friendships quickly with lots of rapport, even though I was still a Yankee. One of the easiest ways to remember to build rapport is to notice some aspect of the other person's rhythm. How do they talk? Is it generally pretty fast and continuous or slow and continuous? Some people pause more often and then speak again. Others go on and on without even seeming to pause to take a breath. Whew. As you notice a pattern, you can adjust your own speech to approximate the other's pattern. When we conduct trainings, we teach people this skill. When someone says it doesn't work, nine times out of ten, it's because they did not actually change their own speech pattern to match the other person's. They just thought they did. It's important to take the time to really notice the subtleties of speech and practice matching them. You can also match the rhythm of movement that another person has. Like speech, a person's physical movements have a pattern. Some move a lot, others little. Some move with large and smooth gestures some with small and abrupt ones. By subtly adjusting your movement rhythms to approximate those of the person you're interacting with, you will greatly enhance the basis for your growing relationship. In summary, if you want to establish a rebuild rapport, match alignment, match emotions, match posture, match rhythm. It works. The next step is to think about maintaining that rapport through time. This ability is what makes the difference between just instant rapport and the highest quality business relationships. The third consideration in building relationships is recognizing that each of us represents something to others in our lives. The question is, what do you want to represent? I know a mid-level manager, Bob, well trained to MBWA or manage by walking around, 
who was moved to a new division of his company. He understood that there was value in being available to his direct reports and in learning directly from them what they did and how he could be useful. Part of his purpose in walking around when he first arrived in the job was to build rapport. The problem was that employees were not used to a manager walking around and found Bob's presence intimidating, even though he hadn't done anything to intimidate anyone. We can guess that the manager that preceded Bob was a source of intimidating feelings. After a few days, Bob recognized what was happening because he paid close attention to the people he supervised. The next day, as he walked around, Bob offered warm, fresh-from-the-baker donuts. As people were eating their donuts, he got a chance to talk to them about what they were doing, what their concerns were, and so on. After walking around with donuts for a few days, he noticed he was getting a very different response than he had gotten before. Bob had changed the way he was perceived. You might as well decide what you want your presence to be associated with, since it will be associated with something. I assume you want people to have a positive association to you, although the specific response you want may depend upon the context for your relationship. It's useful to test how others respond to you presently. When you walk into a room or bump into someone you know, especially when it's unexpected, notice the person's response. When he sees you, how does he respond? Does he light up with enthusiasm and delight? Does the person at least smile? Or do they frown or look stressed or concerned? This test is a good measure of what you represent to that person now. The strategy for becoming a source of good feelings for others is simple. Identify what feelings or emotional state you want to have associated to yourself. Then be a great example of that state of mind and do things like Bob and the Donuts that encourage that state of mind in others. Sincerity is crucial. I've read lots of research lately that indicates the importance of having your nonverbal behavior consistent with your verbal behavior. Employees who were surveyed said they got confused by the mismatch between the verbal and nonverbal messages of their managers. Interestingly, they reported that when in doubt, they respond to the nonverbal portion of the message the voice quality and the facial expressions, rather than the words. If you want to be more powerful with your messages, let your face and voice reflect your verbal message. Now's your chance to create relationships so that they'll enhance you and the lives of the people that you'll be doing very successful business with. So who is someone that either you are unsure of the relationship or you want to establish a new relationship? Pick someone specific to think about as I guide you through the steps in the technique to build better, more satisfying and rewarding relationships that will last and return a generous dividend on your investment of time and energy. Remember, to do this technique thoroughly requires your full attention. A casual listening while driving is a great start to familiarize yourself for the later, more thorough listening that you will do. Be sure you have a specific person in mind in the situation where you want an improved relationship. Try on each of the following as I describe them. Step 1. Goal. What is the goal for this relationship? What do I want the relationship to be for us both? What goal for the relationship will serve both of us now and in the future? The near future and the more distant future. And as time passes, some of the goals I have in the beginning may change, and others may stay constant. What do I want to keep as a continuous goal? What new goal might I want later for the relationship? As I think about the larger, major goals of my life, notice which ones involve other people. And notice that the relationships with these people are an integrated part of the larger goal itself. The goals I have for these relationships can be framed within the larger goals of my life. Goals are important. They let me know where I'm going within a relationship and what the relationship is for. Step 2. Rapport. Do I already have rapport with this person? If not, how will I easily build it? How many aspects of this person's verbal and nonverbal behavior can I easily match? 
What aspect of his or her alignment or rhythm might take a bit more practice to notice and match? If I do have high levels of rapport already, how will I recognize it if I lose rapport, and what choices do I have to regain it? Step three, positive feelings. What positive feelings do I want to have associated with me by this person? What state of mind do I want to be in so that this person will naturally feel these feelings? What else can I do that is likely to help this person feel good around me? As easy as it may seem, remember to set goals, build and maintain rapport, and connect positive feelings to yourself. With these three techniques developing as a part of your natural repertoire, you will have much greater success, achievement, freedom, happiness, and satisfaction in your life. The Great Persuaders. One myth is that they are smooth talkers. Some are. However, of much more importance, they are great listeners. This is something that high-powered consultants and motivational speakers have noticed. I'll teach you how to notice what the best communicators see and hear, the values, criteria, and motivation strategy of others, which can be found in the speech and actions of others, and how to use this information to make your communication more compelling and successful. The second myth of the great persuaders is that they are born that way. Well, think about it truthfully. None of us is born talking, much less persuading someone of anything. It's a set of skills we learn, like all the other things we learn. Some people may have a predisposition to a set of skills, but no one has them all mastered without training. The top communicators that I've met or read about will tell you that they made a commitment to themselves to seek, study, and learn, because they knew that's what it takes to become a master. What does it take to persuade someone? What's the essence of this masterful and important sales? management, and life skill. To gain agreement, commitment, and action from another individual or group. With NLP, we found the answer in this. Persuasion is the ability to offer compelling value to others. I'll repeat that, as it must surely be too simple. Persuasion is the ability to offer compelling value to others. Now the part that's so often missed. The value is not yours. It's theirs. Their values are what they are going to respond to. Persuasive people are those who can see and hear how others express their values, who can ask key questions to elicit values and then include others' values and benefits in their own goals. How do you find out the values of others? People give clues in their dress, their office habits, the way they treat people, and the things they own. Fastidiousness, attention to detail, sloppiness, warm concern for co-workers, needs for privacy, these all express values. It may be natural for you to pick up on these. Sometimes people only think they know what others value, but they're wrong. Have you ever gotten a gift that you didn't value while the gift giver thought you should? If you are in doubt at all about another's values, ask what is important to them. You may want to discover the values others use to decide purchasing, work quality, management style, personal relationship, or any other significant situation. Finding these values is easy. Simply ask, what's important about a phone system? Or, what do you value in an employee? Or, what does a motivated staff mean for your company? All these questions ask for values the standards of performance that the person you want to influence is using to make decisions. These are the same questions Charles Faulkner had you ask yourself to find your motivation strategy and get yourself motivated. If you are selling something, and who isn't, this question can be naturally worked into prospect qualifying questions by asking, what do you want in a, and then fill in the blank, or what's important for a to have? Again, remember to fill in the blank. You don't ask what's a good widget got to have, because there you'd be telling your prospect what values to have. Good. She may want a great widget, or long-lasting, or maintenance-free. If you said got to have, 
You may mismatch your customer because she may want options or choices. Avoid being like the gift giver who thinks he or she knows what to give. Let your prospect tell you what she wants to buy. If you have it, she'll buy. So ask what's important about what prospects, customers, coworkers, business partners, and especially family members want from you. This is the gold of persuasion, the value of interpersonal influence. You can satisfy their desires more completely when you know what they want. You'll also begin to discover these desires and values come in several varieties. For your purposes, it's important to distinguish two types. One might best be called material specifications. When you ask what's important in a product or a service, you may get a very specific answer. The answer could be that it has to operate at a specific temperature, have a certain output, be a certain color, and you do want to make a note of these specifications. Now, if the product or service meets or exceeds the material specifications put forth, what will that accomplish? In other words, what's important about doing it just this way? This leads to the second type of values NLP calls criteria. For example, a part might have to be a certain size to meet material specifications. And because of its size, it will last longer. That's a value. Need less repair. That's another value. And reduce inventories. Still another value. All of these values may increase profits, which is a higher level value. This is a variation on the value technique you did in formulating your mission and passion with Kelly Gerling. The higher the value you appeal to, the more all-encompassing it is. If you have the right size widget, that's less important than having widgets that last longer, which is less important than having widgets that increase profits. In their advertising, Michelin Tire Company appeals to a very high value because so much is riding on your tires. The point here is simple and incredibly important. The higher the value you can identify in someone else, the more options you will have to satisfy it. And the more options you have, the more likely you will be able to give value through offering your product or service. Remember, the higher the value you satisfy, the more persuasive you are. There's even more information to be found from exploring how people think about their values. You may remember that you previously found out your own strategy that determines the direction of your motivation. Now we're going to find out what they are for those around you, those you want to influence. When you ask someone, what will getting that do for you, he or she will either answer with more value words or will answer with words that indicate the direction of his or her motivation strategy. For example, many real estate clients might say, What I want in a house is lots of space, the broker asks. What will having lots of space do for you? One client says, It will allow me to achieve a feeling of freedom to move around. Another client might answer, The space will keep me from feeling cluttered. These two clients are examples of the two opposite types of motivation direction, toward and away from. People who are motivated toward use words like attain, gain, achieve, rewards. Those who go away from use words like avoid, ease, get away from, keep me from. Let's try some other examples, because this is the linguistic part of neuro-linguistic programming. You can actually hear these distinctions in a person's language. Some value words obviously show you the motivation direction. For example, fun is a value with a toward motivation direction, and challenge is also toward. Security is a value with an away from direction. What about when someone says, I want success? Is it toward or away from? Someone says, success is important to me. You say, what does having success do for you? And then you listen for the answer. It could be to live a more fulfilling life, toward, or to get out of a bad situation, away from. Similarly, money can be used as either a toward or away from value. As you learn information about the motivation direction of others, keep track of it. Mentally file this information or actually write it down someplace appropriate.
Knowing this information will allow you to adjust your communication to be more persuasive. Earlier, you learned how to make something more compelling, more motivating to you by increasing the vividness of the submodalities in your mind's eye. Making what you're attracted towards or want to move away from more compelling by making them closer, bigger, more colorful, and three dimensional. Professional persuaders add this powerful dimension into their proposals and presentations naturally. You can do it on purpose. For example, you might say to a prospect who is motivated away from, There are certain difficulties you've told me that you want to avoid. For example, downtime, lost productivity, and cost overruns before they get too close, like they're breathing down your neck. Let me explain how what I offer can provide relief. With a prospect who is motivated toward, you might say, I don't know how colorful and action filled a future you want this company to move toward, how big your plans are, and how my contribution can make them even bigger and add dimensions to them now. When you add submodality richness and vividness to the values and images that your prospects, clients, or employees are already responding to, you add persuasiveness. Even if it's a one to one conversation, it becomes more compelling. More attractive and more influential. Remember the visual submodalities that add attractiveness and responsiveness more color, closer, bigger, richer, more vividness, movies, action, and three dimensions. Remember the auditory submodalities that add attractiveness and compel what you present sound coming from all around, a stereo quality to the sound, richness of tones, strong, compelling voices, and music. These elements make what you do more persuasive. Think drama. Think bigger than life. People like and respond to it. You're like a storyteller of old, bringing to life your ideas, vision, products, and services. After all, that's what all the color slides, computer generated graphics, and fancy presentations are really all about to capture the attention of the audience and have them experience that their highest values will be fulfilled with what is presented with movies, graphics, lasers, or music. And you can do that with them more personally, more exactly, more tailored to them than any computer even imagined now. Because as I talk to you, you've done all the things I've just talked about. When any of us hears something, Even from another conversation, we can't help but make images and sounds of it in our minds. The professional persuader knows this intuitively. In NLP, we know it explicitly. We cannot not communicate. We are communicating all the time. The only question is how elegantly or how intentionally. Combining these persuasion patterns together, The elicitation of values, of higher values, direction, and submodalities into every qualifying interview, every new business contact, even every routine occasion, will, in a short time, make this process second nature and you first. How can you do this? First, check your rapport detection alarm. Are you in good rapport? Great. Now, Talk to them in terms of their values and their motivation direction. What values will be fulfilled? What will they be able to avoid? What will they be able to move toward? You want to be sure to be looking at them when you deliver their value words and their motivation direction words with compelling submodalities. You want to be able to see their responses to know if you need to do more to make the delivery even more persuasive. Now, one more big hint to give you a complete edge. Remember that people cannot not communicate. We are constantly communicating information about how we think and how we want to be communicated with all the time. When someone is pointing his finger in the air, as if at an invisible screen, it's visible to him. When a prospect starts to think about your proposal, he'll break eye contact and look off somewhere else. If he looks up a little bit, it doesn't matter at this point which direction. He's studying your proposal with pictures in his mind's eye. If he gets tremendously obvious and says something like, I can't see what you're talking about, draw him a picture. 
put up a slide that answers his question and his values. Eye movements, language, and sensory thinking modes is probably the best known part of NLP. For those unfamiliar with it, NLP's co-founders, Richard Bandler and John Grinder, along with their student at that time, Robert Diltz, discovered that the unconscious movements of a person's eyes reflected internal thinking strategies. They discovered that unconscious eye movements up indicate internal visualizing for most right-handed people. Unconscious eye movements down and to the left indicate internal conversation or dialogue, and unconscious eye movements down and to the right indicate attention to feelings or body sensations. A basic knowledge of eye movements and body movement can greatly increase presentation persuasiveness because people sometimes stay in a certain mode of thinking for a while. When you can see this, you can respond with just what they want. We have five sensory systems, primarily use three of them for thinking, the visual, the auditory, and the feeling, or what's called meta-kinesthetic. To review, you can tell when someone is processing information visually when they are unconsciously looking up. That is, not looking at anything on the outside, but to something obviously internal. Additional cues include when they are pointing at a place in space, uh, sort of like a screen, when they talk at a rapid rate, sometimes with thoughts disjoined. Another clue is when they use words referring to seeing pictures, images, or movies. When these behaviors are continued for several seconds, the person is processing a lot of their experience visually, if you see what I mean. Distinct from visual people are those who keep looking down and to their left, who list points, possibly on their fingers, who mumble to themselves when they talk out loud in a monotone, often touching or stroking their face. When they use words referring to what people said, what they heard, what they read, when they continue to do this for several seconds, they are processing a lot of their experience with sounds and words, that is, auditorily. Can you tune into this category? The third category is when others keep looking down to their right, sighing, touching their heart area, or smoothing their hands on an arm or a thigh when they talk slowly, using words referring to how they feel or grasp or touch the world in concrete ways. When they do this for several seconds, they are processing a lot of their experience with feelings, if you can grasp my meaning. All people can and often do use these sensory modalities for thinking. Usually we're moving quickly from one to another and back as our experience changes. When you notice someone is using one of these modalities for a few moments, you can match his or her thinking style and increase rapport while getting a very good response. It's easy. With the visually specialized thinking style, offer a picture or movie. With the auditory specialized thinking style, offer words, especially in a list. With the feeling thinking style, offer something to do. When she smiles with recognition that someone understands her, you can be sure that what you present will be understood and responded to. A word to the wise. These persuasion techniques can be used to sell almost anything to anyone in the short run. Remember rapport. If you deliberately trick or mislead someone at the level of values, they will seldom have anything to do with you ever again. Life is too short and there are too many opportunities to put relationships in jeopardy. Tom Hopkins points out that in many ways our work is a numbers game, getting to see enough people that we will make the sales, the contacts, the accomplishments we desire. With NLP, you'll be able to more quickly identify those people that will find satisfaction and profit in working with you. There is only one more influential pattern that's a must to learn at this point. It's not a technique. Rather, it supercharges all of the above. It comes under many names. Excitement, enthusiasm, charisma, personal power. In NLP, we call it personal congruence. To have such rapport with oneself that what you speak 
is an action from within yourself that attracts and influences others even before a single word is spoken. When it comes to ourselves, some of us have more experience at breaking rapport than building it. Think of just a few of the times when you've ignored what you intuitively knew was right for you. Times you didn't do something that you valued highly. When you've done that in the past, how well did things turn out? Not well, usually. Have you ever felt out of rapport with yourself? Where one aspect of you wanted one thing and another part of you wanted something else? When this happens, what do you do? Many people ignore or suppress one of the parts so that they can get going. While disciplining ourselves is a powerful skill for personal evolution, ignoring or overriding parts of ourselves is something different. When you've suppressed a part of yourself, doesn't that part frequently return, maybe even stronger? There's a lot of energy behind some aspect of yourself that will return time after time, no matter how much you try to suppress it. Imagine for a moment what it could be like to have all that energy that's responsible for such a part of you being your ally rather than an adversary. The allies on the inside are just as important as those on the outside. The first step in getting back into relationship with yourself is to know when you're out. Let's take a few moments to learn a simple way to do this. Remember that if you're driving in your car right now, you'll want to do this exercise again later to get all the benefits from it. Here's the exercise. Think of a memory of being out of rapport with yourself. You are incongruent. Pick a time when you are strongly conflicted and were not all systems go. When you remember what it is like to be in that situation, notice, what do you see? Who is there? What's going on? What are your choices? What are you saying to yourself, out loud and inside your head? What is the other person saying and doing? Now notice how you feel. Literally scan your body with your awareness and notice that there is some way you know that you are not in complete agreement with yourself. While you may not be able to put words to how exactly you know when you're in conflict in this way, it is important that you can tell and remember what is the feeling or sensation that alerts you to being incongruent. This type of internal conflict is unpleasant and detrimental to your success in any venture. It's like trying to drive your car in one direction with a tow truck pulling in the opposite direction. Some people get the idea that having conflicting parts means that they are disturbed. <laughs> Not true. Our various, sometimes conflicting parts are evidence of the potentially wide range of behaviors that make us unique and special individuals. It is true that reducing internal conflict improves mental health and over the long run probably physical health as well. The next step is to contrast the experience of inner conflict with the experience of being in rapport with yourself. As before, pick a memory, could be small or it might be large, and recreate it in your mind. When you are in the situation, what do you see? What do you hear? What's happening? How do you feel? Again, remember the feeling that serves as a signal to you that you are all systems go, the pedal to the metal. Another simple question, is the feeling you have when you're not in rapport with yourself the same or is it different than when you are in rapport? 
They are different, of course. Just remember this difference, and you have a great tool to improve your success and your happiness. Once you can tell when you are in rapport with yourself, what do you do about the times when you are not? Many communication and self help programs talk about breaking through and overcoming your own resistance. When there is a part of you that is resisting, what usually happens when you try to break through it? Doesn't it just resist even more? Similarly, doesn't it make sense that if you're in conflict with a friend or business associate and they break through your objections, do you feel good about it? Not likely. What is a better approach to dealing with inner conflict? Even when there is no inner conflict, how do you go about building the strongest relationship possible with the most important person in your life? You. The sequence that I'm about to teach you will be familiar. It's the same one we just went through for use with others. To strengthen the relationship with yourself, use the same steps you'd use with someone else. What's the first step in building strong relationships? Set a goal. What goals do you have for the relationship with yourself? The easiest way to think about this is in terms of your mission or purpose. Here, we're not talking about a particular situation. We're talking about your entire life. The way to begin having a great relationship with yourself is to be clear about what you're doing with your life. What words do you say to yourself that make you feel wholly on purpose? What does it feel like you're here to do? If you know your purpose or mission and align your values and goals with it, life will flow easily. This is certainly ancient wisdom. Be true to yourself. It is sage advice. A second technique for building a strong relationship with yourself is rapport. Notice your internal dialogue. When you talk to yourself, how does it sound? Do you ever talk to yourself in a voice that is disrespectful or even downright nasty? Have you ever done something that you were not pleased with and you said to yourself, You stupid bleep! <laughs> how could you be so stupid? The fact of the matter is, with most people, if they were to say out loud to others the kinds of things they say to themselves on a regular basis, most wouldn't have any friends at all. If you ever say nasty things to yourself, it's time you stop. After all, it is your brain, and you can run it yourself any way you want. The thing to do to change your internal dialogue is just change it. So if you're self critical, notice the elements of your voice that make you feel badly. Lots of people report that the voice is loud and fast with harsh tonality, and some even notice the location of the voice, possibly either out in front of or above and aimed down at them. I know the voice is really in your head, but where does it seem to be located and where is it coming from? By altering how you represent any critical internal voice, you can change its impact. Let's try an experiment. Think of something you say to yourself that's critical and makes you feel bad. Say it now and notice how it feels. Notice the volume, tone, tempo, location, and direction of the voice. Next, change all of the variables. Say the same words to yourself, but align the voice so that it's coming from next to you, aimed out in front of you, spoken in a low volume. With soft tonality and slowly. How do these changes affect your response? If it's not quite how you'd like it, change it some more now. Try hearing your petty little complaint spoken in Donald Duck's voice. I don't imitate that one really well. How about a Madonna style, breathless? Voice. At least that way, you're more likely to listen to your own voice while feeling good. Aligning with your own internal voice is a powerful way to enhance your personal congruence. Similarly, aligning your behavior 
so that it is consistent with your values will lead to greater self-rapport. Demonstrate how you honor your own values by aligning with them. Spend time pursuing them. If you value your physical body, do something adequate to take care of it. If you value quality time with your children, spend it. If you want intimacy with your spouse, create it. I realize I've not said how to do each of these things. However, you have to know, acknowledge, and respect what's really important before you can do anything about it. It's more a matter of awareness. What are your most valued goals or purposes? Once you have some awareness, then it's a matter of building trust in and with yourself. If you've broken rapport with yourself too frequently, it may be more like regaining the trust of a friend after it's been severely tested. It takes time and patience. The third aspect to building strong personal congruence is associating good feelings to yourself. The first two steps will go a long way to associating positive feelings to yourself. In addition, do you realize yet that it's good to treat yourself well? Little treats will do, not for the status or some money trip, although those can certainly be fun too, but more importantly for your personal gratification. Things you can do for yourself now before your ship comes in. Buying the best athletic shoes, cologne, or chocolate costs little compared to how they let you know now that you appreciate all your efforts and that all of you is worth it. A massage, a weekend getaway, a movie series, or season tickets are other ways we appreciate ourselves. Understand that what is important for our personal treats is not the spending of money for the sake of it or buying something because we're supposed to. If it's not something that we really want, it won't be of value. The goal is to find things to do for you that serve as reminders of how much you care for all of yourself. So get to it. Which three things will you and yourself think of first? By simply paying attention to the goals and values you have for yourself, aligning with your deepest needs and wants, talking kindly to yourself as if you were your own best friend, and doing things big and small that are treats, soon you will develop incredible personal congruence through your entire life.